All righty. Let's go ahead and get things started. Just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, for those of you who I don't know or that we haven't spoken before, I'm C.R. Fittiment. I'm the program manager for the Energy Insights Project at Indiana University. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Arif al Assad and Dr. Pratik Sharma, two of our project team members and assistant professors here in IU's Intelligent Systems Engineering Department. First, we'll have a research update from Dr. Assad, who will be discussing machine learning models that are able to use multiple time series to improve accuracy in predictions. And then Dr. Sharma will describe the current state of project data collection at IU and provide a broad overview of a possible data lake for sharing raw data, models, and applications. During these presentations, out of respect for our presenters, I would ask that you please be mindful and mute your microphone. Uh, also, please feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat along with whichever presenter <coughs> those questions are directed to, uh, and we'll do our best to answer those at the end of the seminar. Arifal, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you, Sir. Can you see my screen and hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. I can um, get started. If you have any question in the middle of my talk, please feel free to stop me and ask those questions. So this talk is about uh, how can we use multivariate uh, spatiotemporal machine learning models to analyze uh, energy data. So I, I would like to cover a few aspects. One is how we actually represent data from, from the machine learning side so that we can analyze them efficiently. And then we discuss about uh, recurrent neural network models like uh, LSTM models, how to use them to predict uh, asset properties, especially for multivariate analysis setting. And then uh, I would like to compare them with uh, univariate analysis that we discussed in our previous seminar and give some ideas about transfer learning. For example, if I have two HVAC units, can I train my model into in one unit, but predict uh, future values from another unit, how we can do this? And if there is any benefit in doing that. So just to remind you uh, about our data representation. So in our data, there is a clear hierarchy as we can observe uh, this in our metadata files. So when I say hierarchy, I say that, for example, we create a hypothetical root nodes and the top level, we have uh, different very high level grouping like customer group, uh, EMC, smart factory, and so on. This is the first level. Then beneath that, we have in layer two, we have different facilities and smart factories. They're connected to the top uh, level of the hierarchy. Let me move this here. And even beyond that in layer three, uh, we have energy gateway, HVAC, different devices that we have. And the fourth level of the hierarchy for different, uh, for example, if we talk about HVAC, we have air handling unit, hot water system and so on. That is the fourth level of the data hierarchy. And then for each of those device, we have different features or different sensors that we use to measure uh, time series data. For example, it can be supply uh, fan speed, um, air temperature, mixed air humidity, and so on. So if we organize everything in the data set, it will be a nice plot like this shown on the right side where we have multiple layers. Again, root is a hypothetical node that is connecting everything. In layer one, we have very high level representation. And then as you go deep and deep, at the end, each dot is green dot here. They represent the actual time series that we are measuring. And in this analysis, we are measuring data of six month window. And the resolution of data can vary from one sensor to another sensor, but it can be millisecond resolution or something like that. So this is one way that we are representing our data for analysis and uh, there is a clear hierarchy, but at the end, uh, what we are measuring is a long time series data, which is represented by every dot in this particular graph. So, uh, we, may, uh, we may ask this question, why, what is the benefit of representing our data in this format instead of just considering them as independent time series? 
So the main benefit of storing data as a graph would be that we would like to do a system-wide analysis, meaning that if we have a building with multiple units and then in different units, we have different devices and then different devices will have multiple sensors. But if we prefer to do an integrated analysis of the entire building or maybe an entire factory, then we would like to consider how they are connected and we'd like to analyze them together. So that is our ultimate target. We'd like to represent data as a connected entity and we'd like to analyze them together. And this representation will give us that benefit. So here in this representation, we see two types of relationship among different time series. One is explicit, for example, this type of connection like HVAC is connected to five air handling units. That relationship is explicit because those are part of that HVAC unit. But there are some implicit, implicit relationship as well that is not present in this graph. For example, if we ask this question in different time series, we have data for uh, return air humidity and let's say return fan flow. We don't know how those two variables are related because that relationship is not captured in this graph. So those are implicit relationship and we would like to capture those relationship as well so that we can make better predictions. So in the last presentation um, uh, that we presented last year, we discussed each time series as an independent entity. That means we did not consider all the connections that we can represent in this graph. And in that talk, we discussed some results. For example, here, one recurrent neural network based prediction of supply fan flow. This uh, blue line represents the actual measurement from the device and the red line represent uh, the prediction from the machine learning model, LSTM model in this, in this particular case. And if we ignore all other data available, just consider this on, on particular time series, we can still capture almost accurate prediction of the data by using time series based machine learning model LSTM. If I zoom in, we see that they are very similar, but there is still some gap. That means your prediction is following the actual values, but there, there is still room for improvement because we can still improve the accuracy. That was the uh, content in the previous talk. Today, I would like to extend beyond that because here we assume that all the time series that we have, they're independent but in reality they are not. And how can we capture those information so that I can use multiple time series present in my device to predict one target time series. So in order to do this, let us consider one particular setting. We are considering one HVAC unit. And in that HVAC unit, we have total 18 variables. That means we are measuring 18 different types of features from this particular unit. But we do have lots of lots of missing data. So we filtered seven variable out of this 18 that have more than 30% data present. That means the missing data is uh, less than 70%. Sorry, my bad. So we have, we're, we're considering variables where we have um, less than 30% missing data so that we have reasonable amount of data and we have only seven variables in this particular unit, but still more than one. So we have seven variables that we filtered out. These are the seven variables for this particular HVAC unit. Mixed air humidity, supply air pressure, supply fan flow, return air humidity, return fan flow, mixed air temperature and preheat coil temperature. Those are the seven variables that we picked because we have adequate data for them. In the future, we'll consider all of them if we have enough data. Then we are using a, um, a machine learning model. In this particular case, we are using LSTM, but we can use any other temporal machine learning model instead of LSTM without any problem. So we split data into training and testing, and uh, we are trying to predict one of those variable, but by using all seven variables. So that is what I mean by multivariate analysis. We are predicting return air humidity by using all seven time series that we have in this particular HVAC unit. If we do that, here is the result. So here 
blue represent actual value for return air humidity that we observed. The red one represent the prediction that we made based on all seven variables. Well, now we can ask, is this good or bad? Because can we improve upon univariate analysis? Because we can actually predict return air humidity solely based on return air humidity observed in the past. But here we are actually using more than uh, one variable. Is there any benefit in doing that? To answer this question, we can actually plot both univariate and multivariate prediction that we did in this particular plot. So here, green represent actual time series, red is multivariate prediction and blue is univariate prediction. So in some cases like here, it is clear that multivariate prediction is better than univariate because red is more close to green, blue is far away. So multivariate prediction is giving us better prediction than in the univariate one. <laughs> and we can observe the same here as well. So this is a good example where multivariate or seven variable analysis is giving us better results than univariate analysis. But, well, I already mentioned that there was a spike in the original data here. Our machine learning model uh, actually failed there. And that is one thing that we will have to think about in the future because this is such a surprising event that was not observed in the past. So no matter what we do, it will be actually difficult to capture those type of thing in machine learning models. So this is a success story for this particular variable that means return air humidity using all other variables, all seven variables is actually helping to improve the prediction. However, this is not a general case. Here is another example where we are predicting something else, but we observed that in some case, for example, here in this particular region, univariate prediction is much better than multivariate prediction. In some other region, like here in the last part, univariate is worse than multivariate. So we cannot generally say that multivariate prediction will be better than univariate. It depends on your target variable and all other variables that we are using to predict the target variable. However, uh, we can also say, well, we are using seven variables to predict another variable. Maybe not all seven are important. Maybe only three or four of them can be used. Are we missing on any opportunity here? Because we're using seven variables, but some of them may be creating noise into the model. Instead of using seven, maybe we would prefer to use three or four. That is the question that we, we want to ask now. So our question is, do we need all variable, all available time series to improve my prediction? So how can we answer that? To answer this question, we, what we tried is, suppose we are predicting return air humidity and we are adding one variable at a time to predict the same target variable. Here we are just using a random order. So in the row one, we are using return air humidity to predict return air humidity in the future. And the last column is presenting the error, root mean square error, the lower the better. So when we don't use any other variable, the error is 1.7. When we use another variable, supply fan flow with it, the error decreased. When we used a third variable, the error increased and it is increasing after that. So for this particular order, we can see that by using just two variables is perhaps the good, a good idea to predict this instead of using all seven variables. However, here we are using a particular order, maybe not these two variable, another two variable will improve the performance even further. So what order of variable we should use to improve the prediction that is not clear in this table, but it is saying that it may not be a good idea to, all avail to use all available data. Instead, you can pick and choose to improve your prediction. So in order to see what order, what uh, the collection or what combination of variable would give us the best possible result. We tried all possible options. 
In this case, we have seven variables. So we can consider all six factorial combination. That means 720 combination of variables and see which one is giving us the best possible results. So here is the best performance that we obtained with two variables, one variables and three variables. We consider all combinations and then present the best result. And we see that if we use two variables, the best result is 1.53 error, which is better than just using one variable. And we're getting this for return fan flow. That means when we predict return air humidity, we're using return air humidity and return fan flow. And that is giving us the best result. And it makes sense because both of them were actually measuring some features of return air. But using more and more variables, they're not helping in this case because uh, maybe they are not helpful to predict return air humidity. So this is one particular target variable. Here we are talking about return air humidity. How about other target variable? So we tried this experiment for different target variable. Here is another example where we're trying to predict preheat coil temperature. And again, we did similar experiment. We observed that when we use three variables, that means preheat coil temperature, supply air pressure, and mixed air temperature, these three variable is giving us the best possible result the lowest error in this case. We did this for other type of target variable like mixed air temperature and we observed that again, three variable case is giving us the best possible result. And the variable that we are using to improve the performance may change from one target to another target. And here is another example, again, the, uh, combining three time series instead of one or seven is giving us the best possible result. So any questions so far? So to summarize the discussion so far, what we're saying is if we, if we want to predict one particular variable, one particular time series, we always use that time series from the past that is that is given, but we are also saying maybe we also use a couple of other time series to improve the prediction and this, this type of result we can obtain. But we are also saying that maybe we should not use all of available time series because it may not improve the prediction. Here we have seven time series available, but the best result is obtained by using three variables. It is not any three variable, it is these specific three variables that are actually helping one another. So if I generalize the problem, the problem is like this. We have seven variables. We can represent this as a graph like this, where red vertex or red node is my target and all other blue nodes, they are additional information that I have. And we are asking the question, when we, you, when we predict something in, on this particular red vertex or red node, should I use all available blue node or all the connection that we have in this particular graph? And the general answer is no, because when we keep one edge in the graph or two edges or three edges or four edges, the error actually changes. And the best result for one particular example is just to use two edges in the graph. Maybe in another case, it will be three or four. So our conclusion is not all variables are useful in predicting a target variable. And in our experiment, we actually did some uh, brute force search, like instead of learning this, we tried all possible combination and found out which one is the best. But that is not the optimum choice. What we want to do is, this is actually a graph structure learning problem. Given my nodes, I don't know which edges would be useful. In my final prediction, I would like to learn the structure of the graph from my data so that my final prediction is improved. So based on that, actually, uh, that is what we are doing right now. I, I don't have any result at this moment, but instead of trying all possible combination and finding which, couple, uh, which, pair, uh, which set of variable will give us best possible result, given this structure, we would like to identify this connectivity directly from my data 
and use this to improve my prediction. So everything will be automated if we can do that. There are some papers uh, on this topic uh, published in recent machine learning literature. We are actually studying them and we will be using them. Uh, maybe in the next talk, we can present some result in that direction. Okay, so that is all that I want to say about multivariate analysis. There is one more thing that I would like to discuss is, uh, can we apply a little bit of transfer learning? When you say transfer learning, what we say is suppose we have two HVAC units. We're training our machine learning model in data collected from HVAC one, and then we have a trained model, and then we want to test it on a different HVAC unit. And what will be what will be the performance if we do that? So here is one experiment that we did. We had two HVAC unit. In one unit, we had around 34,000 records. In a time series, we have 34,000 records. In the second one, we had only 290 records. And that is a very ideal case because if I train on 290 records, thus model prediction would not be very good. So the question that you are asking, can we train our model on this first age back with 34,000 records and then predict values from the second one with just 290 records? So we did that in this case. And we observed that we can do this, but the performance is of course worse than uh, direct learning. For example, if we do standard learning without um, uh, training on a different device, the error is lower than transfer setting. And that is expected because those devices may have different features, but the good news is we can still do that. We can train uh, our model on one unit, but still predict things in another unit. And this is very useful if we have data privacy concern, or maybe we don't we have very limited data like here, we have only 290 record in one unit. So, there is not adequate data for training, but we can still test our model on those type of devices. And this is multivariate settings. So all that discuss, all the things that I discussed in the past, they, can, they are applicable here as well. And here is the output. So let us just focus on the right plot where uh, actual time series is green, transfer learning is red, and standard without transfer learning is the blue. So in some cases, red is actually outperforming, outperforming blue one, meaning that transfer learning is actually helping, getting information from another device is actually helping, and that is actually a good news. So I would like to finish with, with our future work because when I started the presentation, I said, our goal is to make this a system-wide analysis. So far in the first talk, we discussed about just one dot at a time, that means one time series at a time. In this talk, we were talking about a group of time series at a time. That means one, this big red thing. In the next talk, uh, or in the next few months, we would like to go one step up. That means we want to incorporate in the entire hierarchy and analyze them together. And by doing that, we can have a complete understanding of the entire system. And that is our future work. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any question, I'm happy to answer those questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Arif. Well, um, if there are any other outstanding questions or anything people want to mention now or hold till the end, you're, you're more than welcome. Uh, and really quickly here, we'll, we'll transfer over to uh, Ruti Trauma. Hi, is, uh, is the screen visible? Yes. All right. Uh, thanks, Arifal. That was great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of uh, the sort of updates regarding data collection and uh, trying to nucleate a discussion on uh, a data lake for this energy analytics application and project. So briefly, you know, what's been going on as far as uh, hardware hookups and 
instrumenting the IU Fames Lab and trying to talk about a broad overview of uh, sort of designing and building a data lake for sharing our sort of raw data models and applications and uh, talk about what possible implementations are there and what are their trade-offs uh, in terms of you know how easy it is to build and deploy them cost performance etc and really as i said earlier just you know this is i want this to be a broad discussion in terms of what we all need and expect from such uh, a common repository so we finally got our sort of opto 22 groove unit installed uh, late last month and uh, we are out monitoring power from three different power panels uh, that are connected to a large number of electrical devices in the lab and uh, we had some initial setup issues of with the hardware and the software configuration uh, we had sort of the default current transformer settings were resulting in a very low and invalid power consumption settings we had like you know 10 watts reported for the entire lab so that's fixed now uh, so you can change the current transformer settings and we are getting reasonable values now so that's that's good and this is all fairly recent so we have something uh, we have implemented a local data collection service so that we are able to obtain all the data from this groove instrumentation unit in our local server right so the groove unit runs its own local mqtt broker right which is this iot published subscribe protocol and we are able to connect to it and get the three tuples which is essentially the sensor id the timestamp and the value of whatever you're sensing and we're able to get this time series and you know store that in a a local simple database so this was again had some challenges uh, the first thing that we faced was uh, the groove unit is configured by default with the mqtt spark plug protocol variant which uh, uses sort of binary messages so we have first had to figure out how to actually read and decode those messages and uh, second challenge was that uh, this uh, again spark plug to minimize the message length uses uh, integer instead of the full sensor id so it's very hard to know what we are actually seeing uh, so thankfully we managed to fix both those issues uh, you can actually use the spark plug uh, protocol buffer definition modify it slightly and parse these binary protocol buffers into actual usable data and the field names can be turned on um, in the groove configuration options so that really helps to uh, uh, speed up this parsing and post-processing so one of the interesting uh, challenges that we will be facing and which is a, i think a good research question to look into specifically in our context but also in general uh is this problem called non-intrusive load monitoring uh it's frequently called nilim uh and the idea is that you know you only have this one power signal so for in, in our example right we have you know we have this panel b which is connected to a large number of devices and we're only able to measure uh the power signature time series at that panel level which comprises of multiple multiple devices so the problem is of you know how do you disaggregate this one signal into its constituent components and the components here are the electrical appliances and devices hooked up to this panel right uh, so that's shown by the figure here on the right right where you have the idea is the goal is that given a power signature given a power time series you want to figure out what devices were switched on and off at what time and maybe even go deeper uh, you know what were those devices doing uh, so we have this draw tower which has you know is capable of uh, multiple modes of operations so can we figure out what was happening inside the draw tower 
um, just by looking at the aggregate power signatures. So this is a very widely known and studied problem with uh, you know a lot of machine learning type uh, solutions which work with various degrees of accuracy and feasibility. But I think we have some uh, we have a larger number of devices connected to these panels. And this problem has often or has mostly been studied for sort of home appliance context where appliance signatures are much better known and much better documented. So I think this is an interesting thing to look at uh, sometime in the future. All right. So, so the second part of uh, this brief talk is really a discussion about a data lake for sharing all of this data, right? That we are going to, we are all generating. Right? Uh, so briefly from left to right, you know, we have all these units installed, which are speaking MQTT, talking to some gateway, which in our case is running locally, but it may be running in the cloud or it may be running in, in the device itself. Uh, which you know, and we want this to push all the data to this sort of central data repository somewhere in the cloud, which has you know common things for data pre-processing, handling missing values, and sanity checking, etc. But also analytics pipelines, right? Uh, so something like TFX for you know, forecasting and modeling, and sort of constantly retraining the models as the data is coming in. And then finally, we'll be building some applications on top of this for you know, alerting and forecasting, uh, doing anomaly detection at real time, et cetera, and deploying this and uh, exposing them to sort of external users and building dashboards and, and so on. Right. So that's the, that's the overall sort of broader picture of what I mean by a data lake and, you know, so now I'm going to, briefly describe sort of why we need this in the first place. So obviously having a common data repository is going to be good for sharing and access of access to data among all of us. And we can implement sort of common data cleaning and pre-processing operations. Uh, this is more important than it seems. So for example, in Ariful's talk, you know, the uh, air handling the first part, we saw the graph go to zero, uh, the green line, you know, that's because of a missing value, which was set to be zero in the pre-processing script that I wrote, right? So we have to be very careful about having a uh, sort of standard pre-processing pipelines, or at least so that we can at least while sharing know uh, what data transformation steps this raw data has gone through. And, you know, there's a lot of missing fields, et cetera, which, so that kind of handling has to be sort of carefully done. And again, you know, going back to Ariful's talk about using transfer learning, et cetera, we ideally want to have sort of improved models by using data from many different sources, right? So we can build common models uh, that have better accuracy by looking at and training with data uh, across different universities and sites. And then build sort of shared apps and dashboards so that there's no uh, duplication of effort. So really, you know, it's a commons for data and models and applications. So with these, you know, participation in this sort of will mean that uh, everyone gets access to maybe these pre-trained models in which, uh, new sites don't have to start processing and forecasting and building models for their, their data, but can use some coarser grained pre-trained models and which can allow analytics without uh, warm up time. And, you know, having this data lake means that there's this common interface uh, to data and the models and the applications. So it's very, it should be very helpful you know, for students and workforce training, you can simply point people to uh, this repository. And finally, I think that there are some uh, more practical benefits or procedural benefits. Uh, building this prototype will really help us understand uh, what are the major issues and pitfalls and benefits to creating this. And we can you know, 
maybe have some best practices and checklists and better software tooling for sharing our data and our models. Okay, so what I propose is uh, not one single giant lake in which is the single source of truth and everyone has to use that, but uh, a fog and a cloud data lake where, you know, we we all run, or if possible, uh, the entire pipeline on our local servers, right? So this is the fog. So that's nearer to the end user. And you sort of mirror and transfer the data also to the cloud. And so this has many advantages. One is that we don't have to wait to get started to build something first. We can all use our local resources. Uh, it's also much cheaper to run a lot of the model training and retraining on the local clusters instead of using public cloud resources. Uh, and we can all, all do uh, data analytics sort of in parallel without having any dependencies here. Uh, I think it's also useful to uh, phrase this in terms of, uh, you know, local versus global models, something that's common in uh, mobile edge computing, for instance, you may have a, a simpler, smaller machine learning model, which is hosted in the fog because it has lower resources and is not trained with all the data. But if you want higher resolution, predict, you want uh, higher resolution or uh, higher accuracy prediction, you can use the uh, model that's hosted in the cloud data lake, which is trained with uh, the entire history across uh, all the data that's available to it. So the first component of all of this is uh, the data storage part. So maybe I'm going to focus on that today, right? And this is sort of going to extend some of the topics that I had talked about last time. So our primary uh, data type is time series of data, right? So this makes it uh, very easy to build a lake because the common data type and format. And uh, what we really need are sort of easy APIs for pushing and pulling data, both in real time and in a batch mode, right? And I think that because of the federated and the distributed nature of our teams, we need, you know, we have multiple use cases and workflows of data. So uh, a single source of truth is not necessary and not possible. And we should be okay with uh, redundancy and multiple instantiations of our data storage. Uh, a few practical things that uh, came up uh, when we were prototyping this. Uh, first is that we need fast ingestion, both as the data is streaming in, as well as for batch workloads or as well as for batch ingestion, right? So whatever we build, we all, there is enough historical data present in other locations, right? So we have been collecting data for a few days. Uh, there is a 912 data, which is uh, in the AWS buckets, which gets pulled in, you know, once every few, few months. So that's a batch upload that we also want to optimize. Um, we also want out of order ingestion and not just uh, uh, time-based things. So, you know, it's very common workflow to fix something in your pre-processing and sort of re-upload the entire thing, right? So we, we want that out of order thing. Um, versioning would be nice to have, right? So that we, we know what uh, version of the data we are training our models on. And because a lot of workflows will invariably have uh, statistical machine learning, uh, we want fast access to both the recent as well as old data. Uh, a lot of streaming solutions are focused on fast access to recent data, but that's not necessarily um, that's not that's not sufficient for a, for a, a lot of our use cases. And you know, currently, a lot of this data is stored sort of somewhere in the cloud inside our VPCs. If you have the IoT hub and site edge configured sorry, IoT site-wise configured, uh, but you know, that's again, in different silos and 
bring them together uh, is a major challenge. And then finally, there's some sort of open questions about, you know, the cost and the management considerations, right? Like, all right, like, do we as a group have access to enough AWS credits for building this and hosting this? And, uh, you know, what about the overheads of building and maintaining something like this? So last time I had talked about this uh, Grafana dashboard where we were able to, to sort of store and visualize uh, all the metrics from 912. Uh, this was good. This, you know, this is designed to scale to a lot of metrics. Easy to, it was easy to, it is easy, easy to set up and use. Uh, we learned a few valuable lessons from this deployment. Uh, it's good for data exploration and visualization. So you have wildcards and functions and filters and alerting, and that's perfect. Uh, but as a faithful repository of data, it's not may not be as reliable. Uh, specifically, the time series databases that are used, like Graphite and InfluxDB, are you know have some policy issues about retention of old data. Right? So they tend to compress the old data. So if you're pushing data every one second, uh, after one year, the, the one year old data will only be stored at every one minute granularity and so on. And that's not something ideal for uh, a lot of machine learning use cases, right? We want exactly uh, the high resolution data uh, always. Uh, there are also performance issues. Uh, the queries are not super fast. So if you want sort of real time exploration of one years of data, that's not, it's not a very smooth uh, operation because again of these time series databases, which are not highly optimized. So this is again, just a sort of a small summary of I think what we need from our data storage. And I'm not gonna to go too much into it again, but uh, we have these various axes, right? Is it optimized for uh, real-time ingestion or bulk batch uploads? And really the choice, so the main point of uh, my talk is that, you know, our choice of data storage is highly influenced by you know, what kind of downstream analytics and applications that we are all going to build. And so this really is a forum to discuss that, like, you know, what are we all building, right? Uh, what kind of data access patterns are we hoping or planning to see? And that way we can really pick the best uh, storage option. You know, is it mostly real time streaming? Is it mostly alerting and anomaly detection? If it's, you know, is it dominated by uh, classical machine learning. And, and, you know, of course, we'll be doing a mix of these and all of them, but knowing what is on the table is good. Oops. Uh, so I have identified a few candidates for us to consider on the right. Uh, we can use standard time series databases like InfluxDB, which we've used before for the dashboards. Uh, these are mostly fine but uh, we may have some fidelity issues uh, down the line for very old data archival and the performance is not the best. Uh, you could use you know, standard SQL and Postgres time uh, the time series flavors of Postgres and that's rock solid. That gives us a retention. Uh, we don't have to worry about data loss, but it's query interface, et cetera, are not perhaps ideally suited for a lot of the real-time operations. The third is B3DB. Uh, this is uh, from Berkeley. And this is in fact, specially made for power data. And this is something that I'm gonna talk very briefly about next, but we can also go with more managed solutions. So the first three are like, you know, we have to set up our own VMs, our own storage and configure and run these. So we, we get a lot more flexibility. But you can go with fully cloud managed things like you know AWS Timestream, in which uh, so it's that software as a service. You sim simply upload the time series tuples uh, into and that service and that takes care of storage and retrieval. There's a lot more on the streaming side of things. Uh, so 
you know, there is a lot of projects from Apache for like Apache Druid for real time streaming and which connect to the more streaming analytics like Spark streaming, et cetera, uh, which can also be helpful if you're developing a lot of real time applications. So I think that B3DB is really cool. Uh, in fact, let me show you a small demo of what it can do. Uh, hope this doesn't break the screen sharing. Uh, so I hope you can see some something has changed on the screen. And I'm just going to plot something random. Um, let's look at frequency. So this is data for one year. And as you can see, these are millions of points which you can quickly analyze, right? So it says that the mean frequency is 59.999 of these 52 million points, right? And this is all sort of in real time. And this is hosted on a fairly small cluster, unless I'm mistaken. So I think it's a fairly powerful and uh, a strong and easy to use system with a sort of clean API for clean and simple API for storing and retrieving things. It's good. It's got good compression. It computes these aggregates by using the B tree. So you get fast averages and other statistical operations. Okay. So the other sort of component here is the, the AWS IOT site wise, IOT hub, et cetera, that we already have access to in some sense, right? Uh, so these are currently uh, isolated by using the VPCs. So it's, I think it's not very smooth to share data across universities. Uh, the time series data is stored in, you know, the hot and the cold tiers. So the recent data is stored in the faster S3 buckets, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't know much about this, the IUs, IoT site-wise was just set up a few hours ago and we are still not streaming, able to get the data streaming into it. So I'm not sure how uh, different it is as a data storage option. But anyways, uh, you know, that was all that I had to say. Again, the main point is I really want to hear, you know, what kind of data analytics and data processing or query requirements that we have and what applications are you know, we all trying to build um, so that we can get a quick uh, data storage, at least a quick data sharing solution off the ground as quickly as possible. Um, so with the aim of you know sharing whatever data we are collecting with each other. And yeah, that's all I have. And uh, I'll be happy to have any discussion or questions. I have some practical question. Sure. Okay, so you've been talking about uh, non-intrusive data analysis, and uh, I, I, I can, I can get how, how for let's say, house uh, appliances that would be easily applicable because those operate in more or less um one-sided fashion you 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 press you press a button on the microwave and the microwave goes through a sequence of power power uh, consumption that is internally defined and is mm -hmm. the same every time uh, let's say if i have an oven and let's say a muffle uh, furnace that is fairly consuming fairly large power um it might have all kinds of recipes, you know, one recipe for sintering uh, borosilicate micro powder of glass, another recipe for sintering fused silica nano powder of glass. And uh, not just that, it, it is not a set recipe. So you have a research process and, mm -hmm. you know, ramp up times and final temperatures and dwells at different temperatures and it's a multi-step process. So uh, what I'm saying is that it will be hard to expect for some kind of recognizable uh, stamp in terms of uh, endpoint power consumption without ability to associate it to basically like go into a 
notebook of a specific student and look at <laughs> what they did, you know, at that time, at that time, at that time. And uh, basically augmenting that by front end data, but from from some, you know, from, from the machine learning standpoint, as far as I understand, this is too much data. Having a front end data is something that you would like to avoid. You really want to learn it in a non-intrusive non fashion. Yeah, right? but so, yeah, so uh, so this, uh, yeah, this non-intrusive is, um, it does need some of this training data, right? So we do need a dictionary of some sort. It may not be a complete dictionary, but, you know, for device use so you know when this device was used in this fashion this signature was obtained i see does, so in the, it, in the beginning you will have to have a lot of back and forth between front end and back yeah and, in the, the, in and the then you will learn okay right yeah but again i think what you said is a perfectly uh valid thing that you know this is these are research appliances being operated in very different ways unlike home appliances so which is why this is a much uh, more challenging and interesting problem for us to solve. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for either of our presenters today? I have actually one for Arifo. Um, Great talk, Arifo, first of all. Um, so I was curious when you when you changed from univariate input to multivariate input, um, the the AI model architecture, the LSTM number of nodes, and those details were kept the same, or you also optimized the architecture for the different different variations in input because input changes a lot, right? Yeah. So the current experiment, they are the same. That means training, testing, split learning rate, those are key parameters that are same. But I think the next step would be, uh, currently we're still using recurrent neural networks, but the next phase of the project, it will change. And meaning that we want to learn the relationship dynamically based on the data. And at that point, we'll have to uh, play with the hyperparameters, but now they are the same. Thanks. So Ariful, I have one question. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Thank you. So the order of uh, the features used uh, the, are the parameters, uh, and 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 the, not the order, the choice. From the physics point of view, uh, you know, there's what's called the physics-based models, right? Uh, how does that correlate with reference to what you picked? That is a good question. I don't have a clear answer. I am, I am, my intuition is from the name, to be honest. If I see return air flow versus return air humidity or return air temperature, I'm, I am observing that they are actually related, but the physics part, I actually, we need help from others. Um, so. I, I mean, that's what I meant. What, what you just said is, I mean, at a gross physics level, um, uh, physical models, um, Maybe maybe that's something which uh, would be a good sort of a uh, test. And and the second, I mean, the other thing is, uh, at some point, uh, if if one needs to deploy this, uh, the prediction has to somehow uh, involve in uh, uh, detection, uh, detection of failures and things like that. And, and I think uh, that that's probably something, uh, and it might actually, right now you're doing what's called as a prediction. At some point, it might be what's called as a uh, smoothing or a interpolation. So that that that's something which we might want to look at. Yeah. The other point, I, I don't need to answer, you need to answer this, it's just some ideas. And the transfer learning concept is fantastic. And I think, for deploying the transfer learning, one might want to use a parallel approach also called case-based learning. Mm -hmm. So what you do here, you, you run the, learn the rules and take those rules and employ it or deploy it in case-based learning. So these are just my comments. Okay, so yeah, I think uh, 
transfer learning is not matured yet, but you said about anomaly detection or maybe extreme event prediction. And I think that can be directly integrated into uh, temporal prediction. Yeah. So if we see something, is it surprising or not? That can be done actually directly in the last layer of a neural network model. The other thing is also the spikes. Um, if the spike was truly a signal, you, you probably can train your network to detect spikes if it were truly a signal. That's something we can, we can think about too. That is very tricky, yes. I mean, in this case, if we observed, if we observe spike in regular intervals, for example, it is easy to predict. If it is really, really surprising and the magnitude is significantly different from neighboring points, then it becomes very tricky to detect that. Yeah, so, so the solution could be what's called as a spike detection. And just anytime you get a spike, you flag it. And then you can go to a second level analysis of the spike. So anyhow, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed the presentation of both yours and Pratik. Okay, so based on the discussion, Pratik, I have a question for you as well. So currently what we're doing is you are giving us the data and we are taking it and uh, inputting it in, into machine learning model and then performing analysis. So there is a disjoint between storage and analytics. Mm. But at some point we want to do this together. So whatever database we pick, maybe we also think about the programming interface. Can we directly do this? Is there a Python interface or machine learn interface to machine learning or Python or something like that? Uh, I think from the top of my head, uh, don't both TensorFlow and PyTorch have these uh, data accessors? Yeah, so that's what I meant by I think uh, this is a good point about the machine learning pipeline, right? That's going to come ahead. And I, because I don't know what all people are going to be using, I thought that at least the first part we should have a, a very simple uh, data upload and in, and request interface, which can be used by many different things, including uh, tf.data and whatever PyTorch's equivalent of that is. Um, but yeah, we need to think about, do we want more streaming based things? Are you going to do a lot of model retraining or is it just a batch thing, you know? Okay. All right. If no one's got any other further questions, we are right up at about 3.30 here. So uh, if no one has any last quick points they want to jump in with, I think we'll end the recording here and we'll, we'll call it an afternoon.